The development of teeth is a complicated and interesting process. An example for basic questions in embryology, morphogenesis and genetically controlled molecular signaling cascades. And despite over a hundred years of research, we still do not understand all of the processes. Nevertheless, it is important to know as much as possible about it if we want to understand failures in development and if we want to do the best for our patients. There are so many questions to be addressed in this lecture about dental development. In the first place, it starts with clarifying, if we can, where at all in the mouth and here, at not there, development begins. How are the different shapes of teeth formed? Why do we have a set of deciduous teeth first and then they fall out and then they are followed by permanent teeth? And why do teeth fit together so well into a proper occlusion with their cusps and their fissures? In the end, it would even like to regrow teeth artificially in the laboratory. Whether this will become really possible one day, you may be able to judge at the end of this lecture. As topics, or as learning objectives if you want, we plan to create an understanding of which soft tissue developmental processes are necessary for formation of hard structures such as enamel, dentin and cementum. To that end, we also want to gain knowledge about where the individual tissues involved in these processes do come from. And of course, we are interested in how teeth get their cusps. There are a lot of good textbooks on this topic, as you can see here below, and actually you can find all the contents of this lecture, of course, all the pictures and explanations in depth in my textbook, Oral Structure and Biology, which is why I always include the page numbers in the left top corner uh, in, the, um, in the slides. <laughs> to start with, let us watch a short computer animated movie, just to begin with. So here it is, the movie on dental development, summarizing the most important events. Here is the embryo, somewhat in motion. We now make everything transparent, what we are not interested in, and we zoom in towards the dental lamina. It is formed already in the sixth week as a thickening of the epithelium of the oral cavity in certain regions. So this is then the dental lamina. And now, we zoom in further and we can now see Meckel's cartilage and some blood vessels in the region. Thickenings of the epithelium of the dental lamina form at the places where teeth will develop later. And these are called the tooth buds. They change their shape quickly because the cells in the center do lag behind in growth and the other cells continue to grow. And thus, the primordium changes into the cap stage of the forming tooth. And the mesenchymal cells underneath become condensed. At this stage of development, we can already identify all the different tissues that will make up the proper tooth. The epithelial cells form the enamel organ and they will later form dental enamel. The compacted mesenchyme will give rise to dentin and to the pulp. And at that time, it is called the dental papilla. All around everything, there is the dental follicle, consisting of compacted mesenchyme. And altogether, this is called the tooth germ. And now we did see the bud stage and the cap stage, and next comes the bell stage. If we cut that open, 
there we can see the stellar jeticulum made up by epithelial cells. And they are star-shaped and they form a network with extracellular fluid and separate the outer from the inner enamel epithelium. And on the inner enamel epithelium there is also a very thin layer, the stratum intermedium, which only plays a role later, after a tooth eruption. At the rim of the tooth bell, the outer and the inner enamel epithelium come together and form the cervical loop, which is important for the formation of the root. The tooth bell now detaches from the dental lamina and above, you can already see the forming bud of the following permanent tooth. Let us now look at the hard substance formation. The inner enamel epithelium differentiates into a myeloblast and on the opposite side the odonoblast differentiate from the mesenchyme. They begin to form dentin and on this first thin layer of dentin the ameloblasts deposit their enamel. In the process they leave behind the enamel rods as the inner structure typical for enamel. For root formation, the cervical loop becomes a forming collar that migrates apically. And this is Hertwig's epithelial sheath, which provides the root shape. The root dentin is deposited from the inside. And at the same time, the developing tooth is emerging into the oral cavity. Exactly to where dental development had started months ago with the thickening of the oral epithelium. When watching this film for the first time, you might think, oh well, I got it all. I got it all right. Well, it's not quite that simple. I myself still do not understand everything that's going on during tooth development. For example, how does it start at all? Why does a dental lamina form at a certain place in the mouth? Why do we have a definite number of thickenings on the dental lamina that develop into tooth buds? or oh, just not tooth buds only, but then also tooth bells at the end. And how do the different tooth shapes, I mean incisors, canines, premolars and molars, how do they come about? And how are cusps formed? I asked that. And how do the cells involved know when to stop producing tooth structure? Well, isn't it sort of strange what happens here? There are some teeth developing in the upper jaw and others do the same in the lower jaw, for example the molars, with their cusps and their fissures. And quite independently of each other, in the upper and in the lower jaw. And then they emerge into the oral cavity and, believe it or not, then they fit together, cusps and pits, exactly into the right occlusion. Where else in life do you find something like that? And as far as root formation is concerned, how Hmm. I can well imagine how a single root is formed, but how do teeth make two, three or even more roots? And of course, there are also some undesirable developments of, during tooth development, malformations. These may affect the crown of the tooth, a crown that is too small or it has the wrong shape or even the roots of the tooth, hmm. especially in the case of wisdom teeth, um, one sometimes finds quite bizarre shapes. And teeth can also be duplicated, fused together, or missing completely. Um, these were just some examples for malformations of teeth. And there are also may be defects in the hard substance structure. Finally, it is important to know about the development of enamel if you want to understand the causes of enamel formation defects. Here are some examples. Fluoride is actually good for tooth enamel. If a hydroxyl group in the hydroxyapatite crystal is replaced by a fluoride ion every now and then, then this tooth enamel is less susceptible to attack by acid. And after all, caries is a disease in which the acid production of the bacteria in the oral biofilm plays an important role in the demineralization of the enamel. But if the cells involved in tooth development now mainly the ameloblasts, are exposed to too much of fluoride, then such discolorations of tooth enamel can occur, like here, 
where you see these lighter stripes in the enamel. In this case, the enamel matrix had suffered and created a different structure, a damage. The ameloblasts were damaged by too much of fluoride. Their enzymes did no longer function correctly and the matrix formation was spoiled and the crystals were deposited incorrectly, which leads to these optical defects. In the best case, the enamel is even quite hard enough and particularly resistant to acid, but its crystal structure is damaged. You can see very well here from the horizontal stripes that it was a systemic effect that affected all the teeth that were in the critical phase of their formation at that time in question of certain bilaterally symmetrical locations. If you know exactly when these regions of enamel are formed, you can then trace back when the person temporarily um, did receive too much of fluoride. And in the second image here, we see a tooth that emerges dislocated into a palatal direction. And if you look closely, you will see a clearly circumscribed enamel area that is somewhat darker, more yellow or brownish um, than the other enamel regions on the tooth. Here, I remember from the patient's medical history, there was an accident when the child was about two years of age. It struck the edge of a table with her upper front teeth and the deciduous teeth were located into the alveolar bone. It is highly probable that the whole dental primordium of the upper right central incisor also received some of the blow and perhaps there was a hematoma that affected the ameloblasts. They could then only produce such enamel in the affected region, the structure of which was not quite perfect. In any case, both observations fit together quite well here. The enamel defect and the incorrect eruption path of the central incisor. And the image on the far right now shows the clinical picture of an amelogenesis imperfecta. Here, there is a damaging mutation of the genes responsible for the production of the enamel matrix. This means that the production of the enamel matrix is disturbed and perhaps there was also a damage to the enzymes that are responsible for the reabsorption of the matrix. Then, in any case, the enamel crystals also do not lie properly. The enamel is brittle the tooth shape then atypical and it hurts those affected patients very much. As you can see, in order to understand such an enamel malformation, it is necessary to understand how normal tooth development and in particular how enamel formation takes place. I would like to help you with these lectures. And the next picture here shows the mysterious enamel malformation called MIH. Since about the year 2001, this malformation has been described as molar incisor hypomineralization. The enamel can be somewhat cloudy, opaque, somewhat more yellowish, sometimes also brown discolored. In minor manifestations, it is still solid, but in bad cases, the enamel may crumble away just like that. It is clear that this also hurts the patients a lot. And in contrast to fluorosis, where it was clear that there was a systemic effect, which means that all the teeth that were in the state of enamel formation at the time of the damage were affected in exactly the same way, in MIH it is the case that sometimes only one molar on one side is affected and the other on the other side is formed completely normally without any damage. And in this case, it is obvious that there is no systemic damage, but rather something that damages the ameloblast locally in a certain selected tooth. The only thing that is not known is what it is. All kinds of hypotheses are being put forward new environmental influences, hitherto unknown causes of diseases, we don't know. But at least it is clear by now it is not only molars and incisors that are affected, but all teeth, including premolars and canines, show these symptoms and even deciduous teeth. So I can say, more than 20 years ago I didn't see this on my patients, 
who knows what it is now? At this point, I would like to clear up a misunderstanding. Some people understand tooth development as an attempt to explain the forms of the individual teeth with the methods of evolutionary research. Of course, there is a history of different teeth, just as there has been an evolution in nature for millions of years. I do not at all doubt that. But if we want to know why the teeth look the way they do, then history does not help us in explaining why they look the way they do. But it is instead, it is entirely a question of physiology. This is going on and on, over and over again, in the course of evolutionary history in each individual. And that is where we have to look. <laughs> and one more thing. Purpose is also not a reason why a certain organ or even the special tooth form is formed in nature. At the first glance, it may sound plausible. Incisors are for biting, molars with cusps for chewing, and canines so nicely pointed. <laughs> nature has arranged that so well, like an engineer would have done it, and that fits exactly to the purpose what we do with our teeth. But in nature, the purpose is not already known to the embryo when the teeth develop inside the embryo. It does not at all know that it will have to bite or chew something later in life. So the other way around, it is right. Every individual has the teeth just the way they are formed, and then they can be used for this and many other purposes. Of course, this also applies to all kinds of animals, which all have different sets of teeth. And people say they are super well adapted to the purpose for which they use their teeth. Doesn't anyone realize that it's just the other way around? But okay, this should not be the topic of this lecture. But it should make clear to us the view of what is going on physiologically. It is about cells, tissue, developmental mechanics, genetic control, molecular signaling cascades, interaction of mesenchyme and epithelium, and then finally about heart structure formation. For more than 100 years, teeth have been a super well-suited object of study worldwide for general questions like these. So how does our dental development start? As early as the sixth week of prenatal development, thickenings of the oral epithelium become visible, exactly where the teeth will later emerge into the oral cavity. These epithelial thickenings are visible as ridges one in the upper jaw and one in the lower jaw. And here in this image, on the left, there is a scanning electron micrograph into which I have drawn the section plane in red. And on the right, there is a corresponding histological section. T is the tongue. MK stands for Meckel's cartilage. And there's even some bone already formed, which is the mandible. And PG, that's the primary palate, and you can see uh, the tongue is still way up there because we do not have any roof of the mouth yet. And so the tongue is located in the common oronasal cavity. At this time, the dental lamina, labeled as DL, are already um, recognizable in the lower and in the upper jaw. And with UL, I mark the upper lip and N, that is the nostril. Well, actually, it's not yet a real hole yet because when the nostrils develop, they are, like many epithelial ducts, first completely filled with epithelium. And at the surface, this is a, uh, called a placode, a thickening of the ectoderm. And when the whole structure grows into the depth, only then do we have the canal in the center of which the epithelium then dissolves, and only then do we really have a nostril. But why does tooth development start right here. What is the difference between the oral cavity epithelium that becomes the dental lamina and the other normal epithelium that lines the oral cavity, which remains, for example, the floor of the mouth? These narrowly circumscribed band-like regions where the dental lamina do form have been called odontogenic areas. That was in 1951, one year after I was born. 
Of course, they did not know what was so special about that epithelium. And just towards the end of the last century, a map of the different gene expressions was described, which was called the homeobox code. At first, this was only possible in mice, which have simpler teeth, you know, only two incisors in front and only three molars in the back. And where the molars develop at the back, the activity of the expression of BARX1 and DLX2 increases, and in front, where the incisors will develop, there is no BARX1 and no DLX2, but instead MSX1 and MSX2. This is marked in gray in the diagram. It will then probably also be the case in humans that the regions of the oral cavity where the epithelium becomes thicker, where the dental lamina develop, are under this specific genetic control. However, in detail, it is still not known today. There are also other concepts. Currently, people are also thinking again more about mechanically triggered forces, where the different tissues grow at different rates and then it is also possible that forces act here that lead to changes in the shapes and forms. That is not a new thought though. It was Wilhelm Hiss the Elder who has described this as early as in 1874 in its main features. And then it was Erich Blechschmidt who has explained then in 1948 the whole embryonic development of the human being, mostly as mechanical effects of the genome. His book about this topic has never been translated uh, into English, so I have just given you the meaning of the title Funktionsentwicklung und mechanische Genwirkung in English as um, functional development and mechanical effects on the genome. In terms of tooth development, here is a diagram taken from this book. This means that the upper lip and the lower lip curl in more and more because of their own growth and the oral cavity epithelium just behind them, further orally, has no other chance than to fold inwards into the underlying mesenchyme. In the kink, it is then becoming thicker and this is then the beginning of the formation of the dental lamina. In this old diagram, Blechschmidt used these different arrows which are typical for him. Um, the thick black arrows and also the thin arrows show the rolling out of the lips. The convergent double arrows show the compression of the epithelium and the divergent double arrows show the rapid surface growth between the epithelium and the mesenchyme. And the numbers are clear, aren't they? So one, that's the dental primordium, two is Meckel's cartilage and three is the epithelium of the lips. I can understand it well that way, and I don't see any contradiction with genetic control either. Of course, the different cells in the di different environmental conditions in which they find themselves will retrieve different genetic information from their nuclei accordingly, which then reveals specific gene expressions. This all fits together quite well. And of course, Erich Blechschmidt did not deny the activity of genes at all. He was just of the opinion that they do not actively control everything, but that they are rather passive at first and are only specifically activated by forces or whatever physical action that is acting on the cells. And then this leads to the differentiation of the affected cell. So that would be a mechanically triggered gene effect, isn't it so? Now we will take a look at a series of some schematic illustrations step by step of how a tooth is formed, starting out with nothing but an epithelial thickening. It is fascinating to see what kind of a huge soft tissue effort is necessary for a tooth to develop inside of it. And the development of such soft tissue is the ultimate reason how the shape of each tooth is created. Let us take an incisor in the upper jaw as an example. So in the left scheme we see the epithelial thickening in the maxilla in a vertical section and you can also see right away that this ridge there is again about to divide. 
a dental lamina, yes. And directly in front of it, that is the beginning of a vestibular lamina. And this will later become the oral vestibule. OC indicates the oral cavity. And a butt stage has already formed on the right side of the picture. It is so that the dental lamina will thicken again like a bud exactly at those places where tooth development really will take place later on. And development then continues as these points while in the epithelium in between remains as a simple epithelium lamina. So the bud is still attached to the dental lamina DL below again the oral cavity OC. And the vestibular lamina, VL, has become larger and on the tooth bud, it is in its center, there is a slightly darker spot marked EK. This is the so-called enamel knot. I will return to this in detail later. For now, let us just accept that it does exist, sort of. And the mesenchyme around the tooth bud has become denser. The cells have moved closer together, so obviously there are cellular interactions between the epithelium and the mesenchyme. This condensed mesenchyme is the beginning of the formation of the pulp of the tooth. And you can already see small nerves and vessels in the area. So NAV stands for nerves, arteries and veins. At this point, at the latest, it becomes clear that tooth development is a process in which epithelium and mesenchyme work together. In the end, Teeth are a product of both of these tissues. Enamel from the epithelium and dentin, pulp, cementum, desmodont and bone from the mesenchyme. We will also talk about this more in detail later. Let us continue with more of these sketches for now. There are further changes. In C, the so-called cap has formed from the more roundish bud. This happens because the cells in the enamel knot lag behind in growth if the whole structure continues to grow. But the area in the enamel knot grows less or not at all. And then the edges become larger and in contrast the center does not. And these are actually mechanical gene effects because growth in the enamel knot has to be slowed down by some kind of controls. We will get to that later when we talk about molecular control. And labeled with C, which is the left picture, you can see even more. Uh, compared to the tooth cap stage, the mesenchyme has thickened further. Nerves, arteries and veins are symbolically shown here. And now also bone is already recognizable. I have labeled it with max because we are in the upper jaw here and it stands for maxilla. At first, there are only small islands of bone, but in 3D reconstructions, a spacious bony compartment can actually be recognized. And towards the oral cavity, at the bottom, at OC, you can already see the beginning of the development of the oral vestibule. The epithelium is tearing in here, and this way the groove is forming. And this is from where, after breakfast, you can wipe out the cereal remains with your tongue in the morning. Uh, the next stage is the early bell stage, shown in the picture at D. The edges of the dental primordium have grown further and now they can enclose the compacted mesenchyme like a bell. At the top, as before, only somewhat more developed, the bone, the nerves and blood vessels and the compacted mesenchyme can be seen. The latter, the compacted mesenchyme, is from now on also called the dental papilla, which is at P. The entire early dental bell is still attached to the dental lamina, labeled as DL, and the vestibular lamina, VL, is also still there. And from the oral cavity side, you can also see the deepening of the groove of the vestibule. And now we have a beautifully formed tooth bell in front of us in the left picture. Actually, it is the mainly the, uh, the proportions have only changed, but let us go through all the parts from the top to the bottom using the labeling. So uh, the bone of the maxilla now surrounds the tooth bell in such a way that it lies in a well-formed bony crypt. 
and the early socket of the later tooth. And the nerves, arteries and veins arrive as a bundle and they are divided when they enter the tooth bell. They pull into the papilla, which soon becomes the dental pulp, and some branch off beforehand in order to supply the tooth bell from the outside. And the whole tooth bell is now enveloped by a rather strongly condensed layer of mesenchyme, which is then appropriately called Zahnsäckchen in old classical German textbooks of anatomy. This would, at the first glance, translate into tooth sack or tooth sacklet, but there is a more elegant term in English. It is called dental follicle, labeled DF in the schematic drawing. Hard to see in the sketch, it is this thin gray line. And also other parts of the tooth bell can, by, can be identified, which we will look at later in original histological sections. We can now here clearly distinguish an outer enamel epithelium from an inner enamel epithelium, labeled OEE and IEE. And the inner enamel epithelium represents the epithelial inner side of the tooth bell and will later actually be responsible for the formation of the enamel. And the outer enamel epithelium is the outer portion of the tooth bell. Enamel does not form here although this epithelium is also called the outer enamel epithelium. You know, these terms are more than a hundred years old and they should not irritate you. Unfortunately, they are not changed anymore. So the outer enamel epithelium is only named that way, but it does not at all create any enamel. Between these two epithelial layers lies the stratum reticular, labeled SR. This is also epithelium. And as you will see in a moment in the histological specimen, the epithelial cells are arranged here like a network and there is a lot of fluid between the cells. We will discuss later where this fluid is coming from and what it is possibly used for. And where the inner and the outer enamel epithelium come together, that is at the edge of the bell, the inner and the outer enamel epithelium lie close together. And this area is the cervical loop, labeled as CL. And when this enamel, or when this, uh, <laughs> and when this epithelial loop grows further into the depth of the mesenchyme, it provides the framework for root formation. And details will also be uh, addressed later. So the entire tooth bell is enclosed by the dental follicle and at the bottom of the picture you can see that the tooth bell is now in the process of separating from the dental lamina. And at I1 uh, you can already see the primordium of the permanent teeth. Um, this is the very early bud stage and then it goes through basically the same tooth developmental stages only much later. And in a picture on the right at F we now see the beginning of hard substance formation in the late bell stage. The soft tissue part looks almost the same as before, but the proportions have changed again. The bone is slightly more expanded, the nerves and blood vessels have now surrounded the entire tooth bell, and the dental lamina is even more separated. And what is new at this stage, however, is that dental heart structures can now also be seen. So in light blue, enamel, and in yellow, dentin. We will discuss exactly how this works in the special lectures on dentine and on enamel. The formation of hard substance always begins in the area of the incisal edges or cusps, and it always begins with the formation of dentine. And as soon as the first thin layer is present, enamel is deposited on top of it. Then it continues layer by layer, starting, as I said, at the incisal edge or at the cusps. And now we have a look at the next stage. At G in the left image, the incisal edge is already formed completely. And I can also show in the diagram how the epithelium of the tooth bell is already dissolving there. And towards the cervical region of the tooth, however, the enamel formation continues layer by layer. And the same applies to dentine formation. It also progresses cervically, and this dental primordium is now about to start root formation as well. By the way, the incremental lines drawn here are for orientation only. In reality, these layers are only about 4 micrometers apart. 
And in the right picture, the tooth crown is completely finished. There is nothing left to be seen on the tooth bell. A very small remnant, the former cervical loop, it is still there and eventually it will serve to shape the form of the root. From now on, this epithelial structure is called Herpvix epithelial sheath, labeled HES in the picture. Dentin is deposited on its inner side and thus the root is formed. At this stage, uh, the tooth has not yet erupted, but it is located, located already just below the oral epithelium called OE. And the dental follicle DF still covers the forming tooth, but only completely in the crown area. And take a look at the root formation site. Here the dental follicle is interrupted, it has been dissolved. Some cells of the dental follicle have transformed into fiber forming cells, which have become fibroblasts and they produce the fibers of the tooth supporting tissue. In the diagram, they are shown in green and labeled DF for desmodontal fibers. And also the root of the tooth is covered with a thin layer of cementum. I was just able to indicate this in the picture as a very thin brownish line, which is labeled C. This cementum formation starts at the same time as the fiber formation. And so this tooth is already well attached to the surrounding bone. The trigger for the fiber and cementum formation is probably the naked dentine surface of the freshly formed root and the cells responsible for this, just to remember, come from the dental follicle in this region. We are now almost finished with tooth development. In the left image, the tooth is just about to erupt with its crown into the oral cavity. The oral epithelium is now labeled here as gingiva with the G, and the root is formed about for two-thirds. This is always the case. Tooth eruption begins when the root is two-thirds formed, and the last third of the root has to be formed from now on. And for this purpose, Hertwig's epithelial sheath moves further apically, and from the inside more and more dentin is deposited by the odonoblast, labeled with O. And then Hertwig's epithelial sheath is dissolved and cementum is deposited on the uncovered dentine and at the same time more fibers of the tooth anchoring tissue are formed here. And in this process the newly formed fibers are deposited into the freshly formed cementum layer so that then makes a pretty strong attachment. If you now want to ask me why at all do the teeth emerge into the oral cavity, I mean how the force is generated for this procedure, then I refer you to the lecture Development of the Dentition. There I will cover this question in more detail. However, there are also further questions to be asked here. In the right picture at J, the tooth is completely formed and root formation has stopped at the tip of the root. But how is the stop signal given here? The root does not grow endlessly, like in rodents, where root grow for life, but this is not the case in humans. In rodents, the root remains wide open at its end and the root formation process does not stop at all. In humans, and also in other mammals, the root tip closes, except for the entry point of the nerves and the vessels. And for whatever reason, the root formation stops. Again, Molecular signaling cascades are probably responsible for this. Typically the epithelial growth factor EEGF is somehow involved in keeping the root open in rodents, but details are not really clear to us today. But let us take a closer look at the anatomy of the finished tooth in humans. At the root tip, the nerves, arteries and blood vessels enter the pulp, but now they must pass through a narrow opening, the apical foramen, labeled as AF. And next to it are several accessory canals, and here in the picture, on the right side of the root, there is even a further canal, which connects the pulp cavity with the desmodontal space. There are thousands of these in the real tooth, but I was able to draw in at least only this one as an example. Of course, this also has a certain clinical significance. Inflammation from the pulp 
can spread through these canals to the periodontal space and vice versa. And that way, molecular inflammation signals like cytokines can migrate back and forth through these canals. And at the gingiva in G, there is also labeled a junctional epithelium, JE, and there also uh, the gingival supporting fibers in GF. After you have just seen the principles of dental development in my schematic sketches, maybe you can now better understand the histological sections. We now focus on the formation of the oral vestibule for a minute. At A there is the rather massive invagination well visible in this sagittal section and the embryo here is about eight weeks of age. And the largest epithelial mass that is the vestibular lamina and towards the left margin of the image the protrusion of the comparatively small dental lamina is jutting out. And towards the oral cavity at the bottom of the image the epithelial masses are still intact. But in picture B, one week later, when the embryo is now nine weeks old, the dental primordium of the incisor is already in the cap stage and we see that the compact epithelial invagination is now torn and ripped open towards the oral cavity. This process continues even two weeks later in the embryo at the 11th week and the vestibule is further ripped open. So far there is only speculation as to what causes this behavior. Quite obviously it could be the nutritional situation. After all, the epithelial cells in this thick massive invagination are not at all equally well nourished. Those that are farthest away from the basal lamina are most likely to die. In which case the rupture, which we then call the oral vestibule, um, occurs here. A programmed cell death was also discussed at the time, but this concept was not pursued further for this area. And perhaps the epithelial cells in this region are also subject to precise genetic control, but so far there is no conclusive explanation or a fully described signaling pathway for this either. And it remains enigmatic further. If the vestibule is formed by the fact that the invaginated epithelium, which first is quite compact, disappears almost completely and a groove between the teeth and their surrounding tissue and cheek and lips is the result, then why do these lip frenula and the frenula of the cheek remain in these specific places? These are actually leftovers where the once compact vestibular lamina epithelium has not been degraded, right? It is discussed once in a while why humans have only two tooth generations. You know, the deciduous tooth generation and then the permanent teeth. For the latter there is no other replacement, as for example with the shark, who has new teeth that grow again and again lifelong. Above all, evolutionary biologists look for remains of testimonies of the evolution history in the contemporary living individuals and these would be called rudiments. More than a hundred years ago, this was also current for the dental lamina. Here an example in a publication by Karl Röse from the year 1895. If at that time a researcher had found once an epithelial fold or a bulging in a histological section, then they hoped at first that this could be an additional dental lamina which may give rise to the development of further teeth. Some people really believe that we still carry in us those rudimentary remains of reptile teeth. More specifically, these were referred to as a secondary lamina or simply an additional lamina. In the top right image, the secondary lamina, labeled SL, is located between the dental primordium and the vestibular lamina. And in the bottom right image, you can see an example of an additional fold of the vestibular lamina. And the two images are three-dimensional reconstructions from histological section series. 
And the color image is a section from these series. And why should we assume that a fold in the vestibular lamina should be an earlier dental lamina? This has even been described as a prelacteal dental lamina, which means for a set of teeth even before the development of the deciduous dentition in humans. I find this very adventurous and speculative. And yet, every now and then there are reports in the specialist press that some researchers are trying to uncover molecular signaling pathways that they suspect in these folds because they believe that tooth development can then be initiated there after all. As I said, it may be possible, but I have my doubts. More about this, about the possibilities of creating a tooth in a test tube towards the end of this lecture. Let us remain now rather with facts that we can really describe without any doubt. As humans, we have two dentitions, a first one and a second one, and that is it. I have distinguished here the white deciduous teeth from the permanent teeth depicted in gray. Here in this schematic drawing above the screenshots from our computer animated movie from the lecture about dentition development. And now you can see that the incisors, the canines and the premolars, or also called bicuspids, arise from the dental lamina of the preceding deciduous dentition. And the first, second and third molars, on the other hand, originate from the distal extension of the general dental lamina. And accordingly, they have no predecessor. Now, there is still some controversy in the literature whether the permanent molars belong to the first or to the second dentition. So, there are people who ask themselves these kind of questions. So as these molars do not have any successors, they probably do not belong to the second dentition. Um, or because these molars have no predecessors, they must actually belong to a first dentition. And well, I think these questions are irrelevant. This dispute can only be understood against the background of the theory of evolution and that does not belong here now. I have decided the molars belong to the permanent dentition and therefore I have shown them in gray. And after all, they have the typical enamel color and the size of the permanent teeth without any doubt. Earlier in this lecture I mentioned that tooth development is a prime example of the interaction between epithelium and mesenchyme during morphogenesis. And on the basis of the illustration, which you already know from earlier, I have listed the origin of the components of the tooth, which originate from the mesenchyme. This is the surrounding bone and the tooth supporting tissue more in detail. The desmodont, that is everything that is found in the periodontal gap space, and on the tooth itself, the cementum covering the root, the dentine and the pulp, of course then these are tissues that have developed from the mesenchyme also. And from the epithelium, only the enamel and of course the gingiva is formed. This diagram shows maybe more in detail what's the case. Let us go through everything um, one by one now. So now from the left to the right. The tooth germ itself is composed of mesenchyme, more precisely of the ectomesenchyme, which migrated forward from the neural crest in early embryonic time, and in addition of the ectoderm of the first visceral arch. And the dental papilla then develops from the mesenchyme. This is where the fibrous network of the dental pulp is formed. In addition to the fibroblasts, which I have listed by name, there are of course, much more different cells, like for example, uh, the immune system in the pulp, blood vessels and nerves, well, details about the pulp will be covered in the corresponding lecture on the pulp itself. And the uh, odonoblasts differentiate at the outer margin of the dental papilla and they produce dentin. So that 
is of course also of mesenchymal origin. And if we go to the dental follicle in the diagram, we see that on one hand, the osteoblasts emerge therefrom, which produce the alveolar bone. I mean, in the area around the tooth, this is the case. Elsewhere, in the skull or anywhere else where bone is formed itself or its cartilage preform and naturally emerges from the local mesenchyme and not from the dental follicle, of course. And from the dental follicle, the fibroblasts, which form the desmodontal fibers and the cementoblasts, which deposit the tooth cementum on the root, uh, further differentiate. And now we have addressed all those parts of the tooth that are of mesenchymal origin. What remains is what is of ectodermal or epithelial origin. And there we have the structure which is summarized as enamel organ. At the enamel organ we can distinguish the outer and the inner enamel epithelium and the stratum intermedium, the stratum reticulare, which is also called the stellate reticulum, and the cervical loop. And during root formation, the cervical loop becomes Hertwig's epithelial sheath, which is responsible for the shape of the root. And the inner enamel epithelium differentiates into the ameloblasts, which produce enamel. In the end, all epithelial parts, with the exception of Hertwig's epithelial sheath, which has disappeared towards the root, uh, thus all epithelial parts of the tooth crown change and become the so-called reduced enamel epithelium and function as the primary epithelial attachment. This means they form the color around the tooth crown when the tooth emerges into the oral cavity. So now that we have this diagram, you can look through it again more at your leisure in page 96 in the book. Tooth development is a complicated process and also a prototype example for research in the field of molecular control during tissue differentiation. This has been and is being researched in close international cooperation. I had the privilege of working here as a national delegate and on the managing board within the framework of the European Cost Action from 2001 to 2008. That way, many researchers also became personal friends. During this time, we met every six months and one can say that we got to know each other quite well. Luca Janval and Emma Tesla from Helsinki, among many others, have been researching the molecular control of tooth development for a very long time and they published this interesting scheme in the year 2000. And before that, it has long been assumed that for every structure, for every organ and for every single differentiation there must be a specific gene or a section on a gene encoded in the nucleus. If we now look at this scheme here, we quickly realize that is, this is not the case. Here are the signaling molecules in tooth development as they were known until then and also written down in which stage of tooth development they were found. The stages of tooth development are shown schematically like a timeline at the very bottom. And above them, the signal molecules and the transcription factors in the gray and in the pink fields. Let us look first at the mesenchyme, the pink fields. There, with few exceptions, we always find the same transcription factors, regardless of whether they are used to prepare the odontogenic mesenchyme for tooth development or how the condensed mesenchyme then differentiates into the papilla. And these transcription factors are regulated by the same signaling molecules, first and foremost BMP, the bone morphogenetic protein. And in the epithelium, that's the line with the gray fields, it's exactly the same. BMP, FGF, sonic hedgehog and wind are always involved regardless of how the shape of the dental primordium is changed, which means in which developmental stage they are. This is an amazing result. 
What does it mean if the same signaling molecules and transcription factors are always active in a process where intermediate stages of development are very clearly distinct from each other? This phenomenon has been called reiterative signaling. This means that only a few signaling molecules or signal cascades are used in organogenesis and they still have significantly different effects on the same cell population, but depending on the time or stage of development. And however, how this works exactly, how the cells know when and how to respond in a different way to the same signal, depending on the stage of development, is still unknown. You will be able to listen to Irma Theslev in person later this lecture. Let us now return to the enamel knot. The so-called enamel knot was described by Hans Ahrens in 1913 simply as an area of highly condensed cells in the tooth bud and that is what he called the enamel knot, EK here in the histological section. What a strange name. Histologically, this formation has nothing to do with enamel at all. It is not even a knot and Hans Ahrens could not know at that time what the cells within the enamel knot do behave differently from the cells around it. In any case, Jana Setkova has found out, which I have redrawn here in the diagrams at the bottom left, A, B and C, that the cells in the enamel knot lag behind in growth, probably through apoptosis or whatever reason, which means cell death in the end. And those are the gray cells in this schematic drawing. And the others, marked in red, are not affected by that and continue to grow. And since all the cells are connected to each other, that alone changes the shape of the tooth bud to the tooth cap, with the brims that have become higher in contrast to the depression in the center where the enamel knot was before. So this is quite an explainable process how different cell behavior leads to changes in the shape of a tissue or even an organ. And how is this regulated at the molecular level? In 2009, Peter de Costa published a map of the molecular interactions between the epithelium of the enamel knot and the mesenchyme opposite to it. The arrows indicate the interactions and I should rather not explain that in detail here right now. You could read about that, if you're interested in, in, in detail, in the book on page 108. The important thing is that we know that there is a lot of cellular communication going on and on on the molecular level. And I'm not sure if, if it is ultimately complete. It could well be that there are many more signaling pathways that we just don't know about yet. So now we have already discussed the basic features of dental development schematically and also said something about its molecular control. Now we want to have a look at a beautiful representative histological section of a tooth bell to see all the details again under the light microscope. Here to start with is the survey image. We see the tooth bell of an incisor in the upper jaw from a human fetus from about the 26th week of pregnancy, about six months of age. Yes, and at that time, the formation of hard substance is just beginning to start. We will see that in detail in a moment. To start, let us have a closer look at each individual labeled structure in higher magnification. First, the cervical loop. This is the duplication of the inner and the outer enamel epithelium at the brim of the tooth bell, labeled CL in the image. In addition, the inner enamel epithelium is labeled IEE and the outer enamel epithelium is labeled OEE. And the cells of the outer enamel epithelium are clearly flatter than those of the inner one. And of course, only the cells of the inner enamel epithelium will then later differentiate it into ameloblasts. The outer ones just remain flat. And here is the outer enamel epithelium, OEE. -E. It is covered by the dental follicle, DF, and you can easily see the abundance of blood vessels in this section, abbreviated as BV. 
And in the right half of the image you see the stratum reticulare, or also called stellate reticulum, which comes uh, more in detail here. What we see here, these are the epithelial cells. They are firmly connected to each other at their membrane tips in such a way that a spatial network of cells is formed. And these cells have produced proteoglycans and other glycosoaminoglycans and other hydrophilic substances and released them into the intercellular spaces. And these proteoglycans attract water and therefore push the cells apart in this way. However, because the cells are still tightly attached with their desmosomes, they obtain such star-like outlines. And that is why it is also referred in German as Sternenreticulum in some textbooks. And in English, this would be star network. And in Latin English, it is stellate reticulum. It is not entirely clear what happens to this fluid during tooth development. And we can ask, Maybe this is used to supply the ameloblasts while they are doing their exhausting jobs. In any case, at the very end, when the teeth erupt, we know that the cells of the stratum reticulare will stimulate the cells of the dental follicle so that they then start the resorption processes in the bone. Only then the way is free for the tooth to erupt. It is amazing how all these actions are intertwined, sort of. We are now approaching the formation of the heart substances. Not quite yet. Here for now um, is the inner enamel epithelium. The image on the right is the magnification of the region E in the survey image and ameloblasts can already be clearly seen here. In region B at the cervical loop, the inner enamel epithelium consists of cells that have not differentiated into ameloblasts yet. We will discuss details of this specific maturation process in the lecture on enamel. Only this much now. Towards the cusp tip, the maturity of the cells of the inner enamel epithelium continues to increase until we will then see mature secreting ameloblasts or in the region at G. And now we see an enlargement of the region F. Here, PSA refers to the so-called pre-secretory ameloblast. They are extremely long, almost 30 micrometers long, but they do not yet secrete any enamel matrix. Instead, we see the layer of predentin labeled PD stained almost homogeneously pink, and the odonoblasts labeled O start depositing dentin before enamel will be formed. And here in this section, you can see very clearly how the odonoblasts differ from the other cells of the pulp of course, again labeled P. They are somewhat more elongated, especially just where they have deposited the predentin as fully differentiated the odonoblasts. And so, and now finally, we see the first thin layer of enamel labeled E in the right image. The ameloblasts labeled A are now not quite as long as the pre-ameloblasts have been earlier. And the dentin has now matured a bit more now, so that you can distinguish a layer of dentin D from the layer of predentin PD. I would like to clarify here again. We are in the same tooth primordium. The different stages of maturity in the deposition of hard substances are found in the same dental primordium in the way just described. So in a way, there is a gradient of maturity along the inner surface of the tooth bell. And at the level of the cervical loop, which is the region B in the left image, the cells are still quite undifferentiated. In region E, differentiation can already be seen in region F. Dentine formation begins and in region G, where we've been last, enamel formation has now also begun. Let us talk briefly again about the dentino-enamel junction. This is where the two heart substances, enamel and dentin, lie op opposite to each other. The dentino-enamel junction, once formed, remains unchanged. From here, enamel is deposited layer by layer and the enamel surface shifts to the periphery. And towards the pulp, dentin is deposited in layers also. 
This inevitably leads to the reduction of the volume of the pulp. And if you take a closer look at the histological section in the left picture, you should notice that the border between dentine and enamel has a very wavy outline. We will take a closer look at this special feature in the dentine lecture. You know, as long as I have been dealing with tooth development, I have been tormented by the question, how are the ameloblasts nourished? I mean, the ameloblasts perform quite a lot of work during enamel formation, many different jobs in a row, as you will see that in the enamel lecture. But here, on the subject of tooth development, I can already present the problem to you. As long as the ameloblasts themselves and also their immature precursor cells have not yet formed any enamel, they can probably also be supplied with nutrients from the pulp. There is only this layer of immature odonoblasts in between and the basal lamina. But as soon as dentin has been formed, the supply path from the pulp is blocked off. And even more, as soon as enamel has been deposited, and then the contact to the pulp is blocked twice. So the nearest blood vessels are located in the dental follicle, but this is quite far away and should not be an option for the supply with nutrients to the ameloblasts. And this leaves the stratum reticulare. In the space between the cells, which are, as we have seen, arranged in the star-like or reticular pattern, there is, after all, fluid, mainly consisting of proteoglycans, such proteoglycans are important macromolecules and thus components for the formation of an extracellular matrix. But they are rather unsuitable as a food source. So, for me, this question has not been solved so far. It is particularly impressive when we prefer to look at the dental primordia in 3D. This is only possible via a workaround of computer-assisted 3D reconstructions from histological serial sections, as we have done this for decades with many postgraduate students and staff. Here is an example, the primordium of an upper right incisor of the first dentition. It originates from a human fetus of about 250 mm crown rump length, that is, from about the sixth months. And this is exactly the time when hard substance formation begins. In the upper row of images, at A, the tooth bell can be seen in gray, surrounded by a bone. And at B, the tooth bell is artificially, digitally sectioned in the middle. And we can see in pink the dental papilla, which will later become the pulp. And in yellow, we can see the layer of dentin that has just been formed. Although this is largely covered by the enamel layer in blue, which has also already been formed. But it is also clear that the dentin formation is always somewhat ahead of the enamel deposition. And furthermore, it is again clear from this illustration that the hard substance formation starts at the incisal edge. Although this is not the definite incisal edge, which only develops when the tooth is really finished. What we see here, now as the momentary incisal edge, will later lie deep inside the tooth crown, buried by ongoing layers of enamel. And at C, we have rotated the dental primordium now, so that we are able to see it from the front. For this, the tooth bell is completely removed, and so is half of the bone. Its mesial part is missing. And at D, we can see the dental primordium with all bone completely removed. And it is also clear that the incisal edge is not straight, but it shows small mini humps. And this feature is also maintained in the finished tooth. These small mini humps are then called mammalons. And in E, we have rotated the dental primordium so that we can have a look from apically into the tooth bell, which is now included again in the reconstruction. To do this, the dental papilla is removed and we can see the thin dentin layer from below. And if we take that away also, 
Then at F, we look from below at the thin layer of enamel. And in comparison to the incisor, we can also have a look at a molar from the same fetus. This is now the primordium of the upper right first molar of the first dentition, and the histological section shows only one cusp because only that one is hit in the section plane. But in the 3D reconstruction, we can of course see all of the cusps which have been formed by now. And at A, the tooth bell with bone and a remnant of the dental lamina epithelium is again visible. And at B, half of the tooth bell has been removed buccally. And here we can see the dental papilla in pink with its cusps, whereby only the mesopalatal cusp is the most developed uh, in that way that it is already carries thin layers of dentin and enamel. The distobuccal cusp is already visible in the papilla, but still without any hard substance on top of it. And the mesobuccal cusp is still so flat that it cannot even block our view to the mesopalatal cusp. So we see that for the, the formation of hard substance in the molars begins at the mesopalatal cusp, which is ahead of the others in its development. And from below, as viewed from apically, we have a look at C into the tooth bell of the first dentin layer in yellow and at D we see the enamel again in blue. And if you look very closely, you will see two narrow projections of the cervical loop in the tooth bell pointing towards the center. If they continue to grow and meet in the middle, then they have taken the first step in forming a new cervical loop for one of the multiple roots that are common in the molars. We will talk about root formation and the question of how multiple roots are formed in more detail a little bit later. But first, we have to talk a little bit about cusps, how they are maybe formed. How are cusps being formed? The division activity of the cells of the inner enamel epithelium is different regionally and temporally, so that this inevitably leads to movements and to folding of the inner enamel epithelium and the inner enamel epithelium lies between the dental papilla and the stratum reticulare. So the cells of the latter are widely separated due to the content of the glycosaminoglycans in the intercellular substance, which attracts a lot of water. We have said that before. It can be concluded that in this way, a certain pressure is created, which is balanced by the underlying dental papilla, which also grows in this limited space and the actual pressure ratios, however, have not yet been measured. They result only as an obvious consequence from the evaluation and observation of the histological preparations with respect to the distribution of the cells, the intercellular substance and the fluid displacements. So in this space, the inner enamel epithelium grows now faster than the entire tooth bell due to numerous mitosis. And therefore, it cannot simply continue to expand flat. However, the circular cervical loop, Hertwig's epithelial sheath, and the continuity with the outer enamel epithelium limit any further expansion. So that the growing inner enamel epithelium must inevitably create folds. And the folding of the inner enamel epithelium is therefore caused by itself. It may also be that the activity of the dividing cells in the cervical loop may contribute to this folding process. There, ongoing cell division creates new epithelial cells which push their neighboring cells further up towards, which also may be a motor for the folding processes, just not a thought, which kept me busy thinking of. We do not know in detail under which control the different mitotic activity of the cells of the inner enamel epithelium really is. There is also the concept of a so-called secondary enamel knot, which is supposed to be located at the tip of the folded cusp epithelium. In other words, each cusp should have its own secondary enamel knot. These should be somehow related with the actual or then probably primary enamel knot as discussed earlier. Well, 
I do not see this connection and I also consider it unlikely that the cells in the area of the secondary enamel knot at the respective cusp tip can act on the cells in the area of the cervical loop where most of the mitotic activity is observed at this great distance. The location of the first cusp elevation is determined by the fact that differentiation into ameloblasts begins here for individual cells of the inner enamel epithelium so that they can no longer divide further. Light gray in the scheme. And these regions of the inner enamel epithelium are lifted by the neighboring epithelial cells of the inner enamel epithelium, which are still dividing at high frequency, marked orange in the scheme. And the first cusp folding becomes visible light gray in the scheme. This is also where the deposition of dentin in red and enamel in black begins. And when all the cusps are connected by hard substance formation, their spacing can no longer be changed. From then on, they can only become higher only. As the cells of the inner enamel epithelium mature, starting from this center, the formation of the occlusal cusp pattern becomes more and more visible, and the fissures remain lower between the cusps and less enamel is deposited here. In principle, the process of cusp formation is the same for all teeth, although there is only one cusp in canines, an incising cutting edge in the incisors, and a typical number of multiple cusps for the tooth shape in molars. We saw in the schematic drawings at the very beginning that dental primordia are surrounded by bone at a very early stage. Now we have reached the point where we can look at the bone as a whole. You will immediately see that the dental primordia, each one separately, are sitting in their own bony compartments. And one question first. What do you think? Did the teeth grow into the bone and the bone gave way, leaving a hollow space suitable for each tooth? Or is it the other way around, that the bone actively grows toward the dental primordia and in this way produces a bony compartment for each dental primordium of its own. We have investigated this. To that end, we looked at the cells on the bony surface in all regions. The uh, two histological images show examples. So if there are more osteoblasts, then we assume predominantly apposition of bone. And if there are more osteoclasts, then there is resorption of bone. And on the right, in the 3D reconstruction of the histological series of sections, you can see it. We look at the right half of the mandible of a human fetus from the 18th week in a cranial view. At A, the teeth are still in place, which means you can only see the dental follicles in gray. In the re reconstruction on the right at B, they have been removed. And then you can see the bone of the mandible with its individual dental compartments. And you see, the inner surfaces are marked in green. So there has actually been bone resorption here. The bone recedes as the tooth bells get larger. But the edges of the bone compartments and also the interdental bony septa, they are marked in red. So there has been active bone growth here. So the, to, the, to answer my question from before, both mechanisms occur bone resorption in the depth of the bone, they are also called alveoli, and apposition of the bone at the margins, at the alveolar crests. So we can then visualize all the dental primordia with their surrounding bone and the compartmentalization by the bone septa. Here is an example of the upper jaw of a human fetus of 250 millimeters crown rump length from the six months you can already see how the dental hard substances have begun to form. How does the root get its shape? Once the enamel has been formed, the enamel epithelia have to fulfill a further task. The cells of the outer enamel epithelium join with those of the inner enamel epithelium. And in this way, they form Hertwig's epithelial sheath or the cervical loop. 
and this is an epithelial ring that serves as a template for the attachment of the odonoblasts for the deposition of dentin. Without this epithelial template, they would not have any attachment surface and no information for the shape of the root. And Hertwig's epithelial sheath, which is so called because the anatomist Oskar Hertwig was the first to describe it, runs apically and the odonoblast deposit the denin on it from the inside. And this is how the root is formed. Here in the illustration, I have drawn Hertwig's epithelial sheath in orange and at its apical edge it is shown bent inwards. I have drawn this from the histological sections. However, it is possible that this curvature is an artifact because we know that particularly fluid-rich tissue, such as the dental papilla, can shrink considerably during laboratory histological processing. And then the curvature of Hertwig's epithelial sheath could be this artifact. That in mind, we can also assume that in the living, it points out more straight into apical direction. And as soon as dentin has been attached to Hertwig's epithelial sheath, from the inside, however, this sheath is degraded again from the outside. Fresh dentin would then be exposed very briefly, but as soon as this happens, the cells from the dental follicle, which is still there, are stimulated to differentiate into a cementoblast and into fibroblasts. And these then form the cementum layer on the root surface, and at the same time the desmonotal fibers are produced, shown in green, which connect the root firmly to the surrounding bone. And these are then Sharpe's fibers. And if from Hertwig's epithelial sheath not all the epithelial cells become degraded, they can sometimes cause trouble only many years afterwards. Then epithelial cysts can develop from them in the periodontal space. This is not so frequent, but you have to have that in mind when you see a pea-sized unusual formation in the radiographs in the periodontal space. These epithelial leftovers are called malassez epithelial remnants according to their descriptor. And for further details, I have to refer you to the textbooks, otherwise this is getting all too long here. Now we also need to address how multi-rooted teeth are formed. On the right picture, we see that incisors and canines have only one root, but bicuspids can already have two roots and molars have even more roots depending on the tooth, three, four, or even sometimes more. In the picture in the middle, I have redrawn an image by Tadahiro Oe. He has also done a lot of work on tooth development. In red, are the dental primordia of the second dentition, in gray the primordia of the first dentition. And there you can see in the molars that small epithelial tongues grow out of the cervical loop, meeting and uniting in the middle. And then for each individual root a separate cervical loop is formed and then from then on you can understand the root formation again quite simply, isn't it? But how is it regulated? that such epithelial tongues are formed at all, which divide the cervical loop in such a way that several roots are formed. This is, as far as I know, unknown. And of course, this must be controlled somehow, but how? You will certainly see such radiograph images of your patients one day, which show the development of the dentition. You can still see some deciduous teeth, I mean teeth of the first dentition, but the change of dentition is in progress and many permanent teeth are already there. And inside of the teeth we can also see incremental lines which tell the individual history of the formation layer by layer. There is more anatomical knowledge about the course of these growth lines in the enamel and in the dentine for the permanent teeth, for the second dentition than for the teeth of the first dentition. This is somehow reasonable because the roots of the deciduous teeth are resorbed before these teeth fall out. And therefore, deciduous tooth roots very rarely make it to the laboratory for investigation. So let us look at the course of the growth lines for the permanent teeth. You can see that 
um, the teeth represent a clock, so to speak. You can read off exactly at what time the respective line was formed. And the actual distances are, of course, much smaller than shown in this diagram. In reality, the incremental lines have a distance of 4 micrometers in the enamel, and in dentin they are more variable, but also about as small. And there is another special feature, the neonatal line. This is drawn in red and shows the state of tooth development at the time of birth. In the first permanent molar, you can see it in the enamel and in dentin. And the other permanent teeth do not show this. They were not so far developed at birth. Now we have come this far and have addressed some important aspects of tooth development. You have now been given a fairly good overview of the processes in space and in time, some of which are very complex. However, we have also addressed many open questions. And yet, the wish is there that one day it will hopefully be possible to grow a human tooth in a test tube in the laboratory. What do you think? Is that possible with the current state of knowledge? It would be nice and necessary. You have certainly seen people who are missing the second incisor in the upper jaw. This tooth may be prone to aplasia. In the case of premolars, one or more can also be missing, and if a wisdom tooth is missing, that would not be so big of a drama. But if there is loss of a tooth due to trauma or even due to inflammation in the periodontal space, in any case, it would certainly be better to somehow have more biological solutions for replacing a tooth instead of adhesive bridges or implant-supported restorations. If you ask Google about the topic tissue engineering a tooth, you will find over 39 million entries in less than half of a second. I have been fortunate to meet most of the researchers in the field of tooth development in person at many congresses. Already in 1995, I was able to organize the 10th International Symposium on Dental Morphology in Berlin. And in 2010, it was mainly about tooth development, so all these experts came to Berlin again. Then I was the president of the 10th International Symposium on Tooth Morphogenesis and Differentiation. There were about 250 experts in the field who gathered for four whole days, and I was even able to play the musical introduction with the personal consort at that is my, at that time, chamber orchestra on my cello. And here in the left picture, you can catch a bit of the atmosphere in the lecture hall. All seats were occupied for the whole time. And on the right, there are the posters. They were available for discussion the whole time during the Congress. I can even show you a little video as it was broadcasted in the Berlin TV those days. Um, the report was originally in German, but they also sent me a version with an English voiceover produced by the company. And you are lucky now, at the end of that video, you will be able to listen to two interviews I had with Irma Theslev and with Paul Sharp, eminences in this field of research. The 10th TMD meeting took place from September the 1st to the 4th, 2010 in Berlin. TMD stands for Tooth Morphogenesis and Differentiation, and this Congress takes place every three years. Again, around 150 experts from all over the world come together to exchange their latest knowledge. How far have we come in creating a test tube tooth? IGTV has interviewed the Congress President, Ralph Radlansky. A test tube tooth? Only an imagination? In general, we have the desire to replace any organ that has been lost. It is a challenge to replace it with naturally grown tissues. Although it sounds like science fiction, there is progress in the cell culture lab, and sometime in the future we do hope to also create a tooth that way. What is the state of the art today? 
Processes of cell and tissue differentiation are highly complicated. Cells do interact, they must communicate when creating different tissues. In a tooth, we have many different tissues close, close together, like enamel, dentin, the pulp, nerves, vessels, cementum that covers the root, and fibres that anchor the tooth to the alveolar bone. All this must arise and must be very well coordinated during morphogenesis. Today, there is knowledge of how the number of cusps of a tooth or the number of roots are regulated. On the other hand, we do not know exactly how the form of a tooth is produced, and we also do not know in detail how the tooth bone interface is created, which is necessary when a tooth should be attached to bone. What are the highlights of this 10th TMD meeting? Here in Berlin, we have the 10th TMD meeting, the one before took place in Zurich three years ago. In the meantime, many more of the signaling cascades that regulate the interaction between the cells have been elucidated. Many more molecular players have been discovered, and the more is known, the more complex the signa signaling cascades have become. On the other hand, more and more anatomical details have been discovered today because now, with computer-aided technology, we can gain a more comprehensive insight on the microscopical level in three dimensions. This way, in combining molecular research with morphological anatomical explorations, we understand much better how the stage is set, where the molecular processes take place. The program showed an abundance of highly specialised presentations. In order to gain a survey of the contemporary view, Professor Radlansky has asked two of the leading experts in this field, Professor Irma Thesloff from Helsinki and Professor Paul Sharp from London. Yeah, liebe Irma, it was you who discovered some 15 years ago that there were much less genes involved in differentiating processes like creating a tooth. It was called the reiterative signaling. So is it still that simple 15 years afterwards? So, well, uh, what we actually discovered is that we, rea we realized that, that the teeth are very similar to all other organs and mm. that there, are, is, there is this toolkit of, of molecules or signal molecules mm. that are used uh, in all developmental tissues for cell communication. Mm. And, uh, of course, more genes have been found mm -hmm. over the years and there are activators and inhibitors and it's a very complex system. Yeah. The more we ask, the more we know, so, and it's getting more and more information. Do you think that there is some light at the end of the tunnel that might lead us to some molecular medicine at the end of the day? Well, at least I would like to believe so and, and, and uh, I, I hope that it will be possible to, to use this information for molecular medicine purposes. Mm -hmm. and, and, but then we, because the system is so complex that we biologists really cannot really grasp it anymore, so we need help from the system biologists mm -hmm. uh, and computer uh, people to, um, to tell us uh, how, how, the, mm -hmm. how the system works when, it, when the balance is kind of broken with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some molecular medicine approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, Depaul, you were the first one to show that it might be possible to create a tooth out of tissue in order to prove to uh, replace a tooth in dentition. Uh, how far have you arrived? How far have we got <laughs> since then? Uh, I think us and a number of other people have shown that in, in theory it's possible mm -hmm. um, in animal uh, mm -hmm. situation. Uh, the big difference is taking those studies into human. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there, there are a number of major obstacles. Um, the cells that you can use very easily in an animal are not readily usable in a human. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the big challenge is to, to identify where you can take the cells from, how you can grow them in conditions that they will still be able to, to form a tooth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, again, you've really not got to lose sight of the fact that whatever um, scientists can do in laboratories, it's not going to be of any use unless it is simple, safe and inexpensive compared mm -hmm. with what's already possible. Mm -hmm. and, and they're not trivial issues. So I, I think w th there has been a lot of progress made over the last five years, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but to get to the point where a patient can go to a dentist and say, I would like this kind mm -hmm. of replacement, is a, is a long, long way off. Mm -hmm. Are we going to live to see it? <laughs> <laughs> Here he is, Paul Sharp. He is professor at King's College in London and also founded a company, Odontis. In 2004, there was even a cash prize of £500,000 for what was then very promising laboratory work on mouse teeth. 
by the human tooth from the test tube could unfortunately not be produced until today. Here is another promising website news from 2018 about it. The project Tooth from the Test Tube was called Biotooth in short form. And this should make dentures obsolete in that a bunch of stem cells were supposed to develop into a tooth within two weeks. So this is a press release two weeks in a pretty short time. It takes much longer in nature. We observed the first thickening of a dental lamina in the embryo of six weeks and only after another seven and a half interurine months of development plus six months of life as a baby, the first deciduous tooth emerges into the oral cavity at the age of six months. And permanent canines take the longest time to form and to erupt, emerging not before 10 to 14 years of age and wisdom teeth can even take longer. Here is a report from the company Dentigenics from 2002. At that time, it was assumed that the odontogenic tissues that are to develop into a tooth need a scaffold that ensures the correct tooth shape. In other words, a kind of cell culture whereby the shape of the tooth must be predetermined by this kind of framework. And this is what is meant by the term scaffold. In a review article published in 2016, we read that it is probably not possible to create a test tube tooth without such three-dimensional templates. With this technique, stem cells are obtained from postnatal tooth buds of laboratory animals and seeded into such scaffolds. And these scaffolds were implanted into the kidney capsule or into the greater omentum uh, at the intestine of the experimental in, uh, enamel no, <laughs> the experimental animal for further maturation. But unfortunately, only small tooth-like structures could be obtained in this way and the number, shapes and sizes could not be controlled. But it was also reported about test tube teeth which did develop without any scaffold. This was already in 2009 and it was published in the renowned Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. Stem cells were collected from postnatal tooth buds of beagle dogs and this cell aggregation was cultured in 3D cell cultures for five to seven days up to the early bell stage and then they were transplanted into the alveolar bone of the recipient animal. The tooth developed and erupted after 40 days and came to occlusion after 50 days and success rate was 56%. Here I have copied some of the illustrations from the article. However, already at the very beginning, the method did not become completely clear to me. The exact origin of the stem cells remains unclear also. And then according to the drawing, the individually presented epithelial cells and the mesenchymal cells are supposed to continue to develop in a 3D cell culture to form these desired tooth germs. If it is not a scaffold, what does the 3D cell culture look like? And that has remained unclear to me also. And I find the histological image amazing. And at least the small white arrow at the bottom right of the image indicates what has been achieved. Although no multicusp molar was produced, at least a single cusp tooth was produced, apparently with a functioning root, including periodontium. That was in 2009 in the dog. And another report again on the dog, this time from a different group of researchers, now from 2019. Postnatal canine does not mean postnatal canine tooth, but it said a dog that already born. For this purpose, a molar primordium, again from a beagle dog, 30 years old, is taken out and epithelial cells and mesenchymal cells are separated from each other and then they are supposed to reassemble in an organ culture to form a dental primordium. I haven't understood yet why epithelium and mesenchyme were separated at first, just to show that the separated epithelial and mesenchymal cells reform into a dental primordium at the belt stage all by themselves? Difficult to believe. 
And then it is not explained how long this tooth graft continues to develop in the kidney capsule of the mouse before it is transplanted into the canine jaw. At C and at D is a comparison between a naturally maintained tooth graft at C and a bioengineered, that is, laboratory produced tooth germ at D. So histologically, it looks good. But I still find it difficult to believe that the epithelial and mesenchymal cells, which at the very beginning, that is at the very top at A, together have been such a beautiful tooth bell, after their separation then come together again in the organ culture to re-establish such a beautiful tooth bell, as at the bottom right. It is written and depicted there. I must believe it, don't I? Here are some more details. The first line in the top right hand corner of the scheme shows the dog jaw into which the laboratory produced tooth germ is inserted. And at the very bottom at G, the tooth shape and histology of a natural tooth, top row, is compared with the transplanted but naturally obtained and unchanged transplanted tooth germ middle row. And in the bottom row, it is then a tooth germ that has been grown in the laboratory using the method which I do not understand in full details. That looks amazingly good, doesn't it? And here, still from the same publication, the comparison of the hard substances, enamel and dentin, in the scanning electron microscope. In fact, I could not allocate the individual images whether it is an unchanged natural tooth germ, a transplanted tooth germ, or a tooth germ produced in the laboratory. On the far right, the content of the typical elements also no difference. And finally, still from the same publication, now the proof that the laboratory tooth is surrounded by a physiologically correctly functioning periodontium. It was moved orthodontically and it worked. So these are already amazingly convincing proofs for the fact that epithelial and mesenchymal cells, after being separated in the laboratory, can come together again after the separation to a functioning tooth germ, with the result that I cannot distinguish the quality of the microstructure from each other. And this laboratory tooth also obtained a correct attachment to the periodontium, proven by an orthodontic treatment. Up to this point, these were experiments on non-human material, mainly mouse and finally the beagle dog. In the following, we will now deal with human tooth systems. Jennifer Rosowski in Berlin takes a completely different approach. She told me that we don't need to know in detail all the signaling molecules and signaling cascades involved in tooth development nor do we need to know all the physiological processes that lead to the formation of the shape during tooth development anyway. You know, just as an embryo develops completely in the womb without the mother herself being aware of the biochemistry, signaling cascades and biomechanics of all these developmental processes, Jennifer Rosowski wants to provide the cells that are necessary for tooth development with the physical and biochemical and physiological environmental conditions in which they can devote themselves to undisturbed uh, following their development. It is understandable that cells in cell cultures sense that something is different than their natural surroundings and therefore they might behave differently and the development does not work out properly. So it's about the early phase of development of a dental primordium in cell culture and it is about human stem cells material. For this purpose pulp cells were taken from freshly extracted wisdom teeth and the stem cells of the pulp then multiplied in the cell culture within 72 hours. And you can see that at C on the right that in a common standard cell culture, such as cell lawn of fibroblast-like cells has developed. But the research group led by Jenny Rosowski did not leave it at that, but rather, and this is the innovative 
thing about the approach. Cell culture conditions have been established in which the cells do not notice that they are in an artificial environment. The most important thing is that this is an ultra-low attachment, which means the cells do not come into contact with any plastic walls or whatsoever. And then not only do not again these fibroblast-like flat cell lawns grow from, but the pulp stem cells begin to behave like cells of an early tooth germ. That is, at least on the molecular biological level. They then express signaling molecules as indicated on the right in the picture, for example, BMPs, TGFs, FGF, MSX, which you already know from the scheme of Janval and Teslev on the reiterative signaling during tooth development. And in co-culture with epithelial cells, these pulp stem cells condensates then produce other typical proteins, such as collagens and cytokeratins, verified by immunofluorescence at B to F. And the epithelial cells even migrated into the condensate at H and I on the far right. I can summarize this work hopefully correctly by saying that human pulp stem cells have developed under these special no-contact conditions to such an extent that they reveal some properties that are typical of cells of dental primordia. But a whole tooth bud, a cap, a tooth bell, or even a finished tooth has not yet developed in this way. We were in good personal contact and wanted to develop some projects together, but then came the COVID-19 pandemic and under these conditions it all came to a halt with no further development. But I'm excited about what is still to come. Very recently, we are now in the year 2023, there are reports from Japan where it is hoped that with the USAG-1 gene, which is actually also related to the development of the uterus, an overriding regulator has been found that it is said to control all signal cascades in tooth development. So the USAG-1 knockout mice, these are mice in which the USAG-1 gene does not exist, have supernumerary teeth, which is thought to be due to an increase in BMP signaling pathway. It is thought that USAG-1 normally prevents further generations of teeth from developing in humans than just the usual first and second dentition in humans. In sharks, many generations of teeth follow each other endlessly, you know that. In humans, only two. And USAG-1 is supposed to be responsible for this. And there are patients in whom individual teeth are not formed or there is even a complete aplasia of all teeth. And now it is hoped that tooth development can be stimulated by slowing down the effect of USAG-1 because USAG-1 is supposed to prevent tooth development. Well, USAG-1 does obviously exist, but I'm still a little scared skeptical that the control of this one single gene can completely regulate tooth development. Of course, teeth do develop even if we don't know all of their signaling molecules. We don't even know yet which signaling molecules are working invisibly and we haven't discovered them yet. But if we want to intervene into a natural process, we have to know what we are controlling or preventing. And further questions, which tooth should it be that has to be redeveloped because it is missing? And if, as in the case of the shark, endless tooth generations can be triggered, where should they all go and how is this slowed down then? I mean, in the patients. So I do believe that we are on the right track towards a molecular medicine but whether the USAG-1 gene is really the most important gene in tooth development, I don't know. I hope this is not deceiving. But it's probably not that simple after all. This review sums it up. The hardest tissue of the human body may be hard to regenerate. Just to make it clear, again, enamel is actually not a tissue, because it neither contains cells nor fibers. Anyway, here are the key statements. 
It is still challenging and then the laboratory tooth, if it ever exists, still has to establish a physiological connection to the bone. And then, just as with the currently available alloplastic dental implant systems, the question arises as to how good the bone still is where the test tube tooth is to be placed. And that doesn't help if the patients maybe suffer from general diseases. And of course, this is also a fundamental question when the alloplastic implants just mentioned. And infections can be a problem also. So at least the test tube tools should be compatible with the immune system. Immunosuppression of the patient, as it is currently the case with other organ transplants, would probably not be appropriate for a tooth. And we still have to talk about the costs. They are unpredictable at the moment. Irrespective of everything that has been said so far, nature shows us that it is quite capable of creating teeth even in places where they are not expected. Here, for example, in an ovarian teratoma in humans. The pathologist Ulrich Gross gave me this specimen and was, we examined it together histologically. The dentine looks really good and the desmodont also has a typical structure. Now we have almost reached the end of this long lecture, but there are still a lot of unanswered questions, especially on the topic of the tooth from the test tube. The findings from the animal experiments can only be transferred to humans to a ex limited extent. And in general, many sentences and some wording in the studies cited in this lecture have remained very unclear, especially at the crucial points or I simply did not understand them correctly. With regard to human material, no human tooth has ever been grown in a test tube. At most, there have been approaches at the cellular level that show that certain necessary signaling proteins were also expressed in these cells. But the question remains whether these signaling proteins are really important for the development of a tooth. Think about the uh, listing of the reiterative signaling. There are BMPs, FGFs, WINs, and what they are called. Those occur in other tissues as well, so they are not necessarily specific to dental development. And the human dentition is also quite complex. Every tooth looks different. And if you want to replace a tooth, it has to have the, exactly the right shape in the dental arch, otherwise, it won't fit. And is knowledge of molecular control really important if you want to make a tooth in the lab? In some places, maybe yes, if you want to intervene in a controlling a way. But many things develop on their own without us knowing all the signaling molecules. We must also ask whether the results of molecular control in mice can also be transferred to humans. After all, we need a species-specific human tooth for humans. And as I said, it must be clear from the outset which tooth is to grow there. And intensive research has been going on for decades and we have seen examples, but so far it has not been possible to grow a human replacement tooth from stem cells or whatever. Maybe one day you will see that it works. Now for the take-home message. We have discussed in detail the stages of tooth development. Key dates are beginning of tooth development when the epithelial dental lamina sinks down into the mesenchyme at six weeks. We observe the first hard substance formation in the fetus when it is six months old. And teeth are formed from the interaction of both tissues, epithelium and mesenchyme. We have discussed that the exact origin of each part of the tooth. Cusp formation is complicated and whether it is really subject to molecular control is questionable in detail, just as there has never been a human tooth from a test tube. And with this beautiful picture of my stallion Poseidon, I would like to thank you for your attention to this lecture.